Hi again. In John Urquhart, The Wonders of Prophecy, we're in chapter four now on Egypt. He spends about a third of the book on the subject of prophecy in Egypt. And now, it needs to be said up front, the one need not agree with each interpretation or every detail of Urquhart's interpretation to admit this, the general force of his argument. One could dispute the way he interprets many of the texts in the prophets as to their details. However, the, the force of it, the, the force of the argument remains un, unimpaired, I would say, at the end of all of that, because there are cities mentioned in the Bible, some I already knew well, long before I read Urquhart, some like Babylon and Nineveh were the outstanding cities in the world of the, when the prophets were alive, and they have gone, they have disappeared completely, so much so that Nineveh had to be dug up, literally dug up. A lot of people didn't believe it had ever existed because of the importance it had in the Bible and that no one had found it. That was the case of things around 1850, around the time Urquhart was a, a boy. So he knows all the archaeology and all of the recoveries of ancient artifacts that led up to the restoration of the Bible's historical reputation back in the day when it was under fire from the so-called higher critics. So when he deals with Egypt here, it's, it's very obvious he's, he's at the mercy of his archaeological and historical knowledge too. So again, the details, might, might you might differ on them, but the force of the argument remains. remains. So chapter 4, Egypt. Were we asked to say what country it is which is celebrated alike for the highest antiquity as for, the, as for early and unequaled and long-continued eminence in science, in the arts, in an enlightened and refined civilization, in luxury and magnificence, which has continued through all history, a realm of wonder, and which still plays a part in the commerce and in the politics of the world, there could be but one answer. It is the land of Egypt. Like its own monuments, which in their colossal greatness bid a calm but proud defiance to the ravages of time, this land lives on. It is still the home of the descendants of its ancient masters. It still possesses the blessing of that rare fertility which proved the foundation of its past splendor. And if it does, like its monuments, show that in the struggle with time it has not come off unscathed, if the hand of decay has left its impress, it may find some satisfaction in the thought that to its long and proud career there is no parallel in the whole world beside. But Egypt has also another claim to attention. In no land have the prophecies of the Old Testament received a more striking fulfillment than in this. In the misery of its people and the ruin of its cities, it bears overwhelming, though involuntary, testimony to the claims of Scripture. To part of this testimony we shall now listen. Thebes, he takes up the ancient capital of Egypt first. Thebes, the ancient capital of Egypt, was called by the Greeks Diospolis, the city of Jupiter. This appears to have been a literal translation of the Egyptian name No Ammon, which appears in Nahum chapter 3, verse 8. The latter name signifies the portion or abode of the god Ammon, in whom the Greeks believe they recognize their own Zeus, the Roman Jupiter. The first part of this name, No, is that by which the city is generally designated in the scriptures. The praises of the city with its hundred gates were sung of old by Homer, and the graphic picture which the poet presents of its populousness is outshone by the sober statement of, of Tacitus that it could send into the field an army of 700,000 men. Diodorus Siculus, who visited Egypt around 50 BC, and who saw Thebes only in its ruin, cannot restrain his admiration. The sun, had never, the sun had never seen, he says, so magnificent a city. He says, quote, never was there a city which received so many offerings in silver, gold, and ivory, colossal statues, and obelisks, each cut from a single stone. Four principal temples are especially admired there, the most ancient of which was surpassingly grand and sumptuous. It was 13 stadia, that is one mile and three quarters, in circumference, and surrounded by walls 24 th feet thick in thickness and 45 cubits high. 
The richness and workmanship of its ornaments were correspondent to the majesty of the building, which many kings contributed to embellish. End of quote from Diodorus Siculus. The testimony of Diodorus is amply confirmed by the remains, the stupendous ru ruins of Luxor and Karnak, parts of the ancient No which are still inhabited, ex excite today the same feelings of admiration and amazement. The great temple of Karnak is the largest and most splendid ruin of which perhaps either ancient or modern times can boast. That's a quote from Wilkinson's Ancient Egyptians. All here is sublime, all majestic. With pain one tears oneself from Thebes. Her monuments fix the traveler's eyes and fill his mind with vast ideas. Beholding colossal figures and stately obelisks which seem to surpass human powers, he says, man has done this, and feels himself and his species ennobled. That's from a writer on Egypt called Savari, S-A-V-A-R-Y. Of the Great Hall, Miss Amelia B. Edwards writes, quote, It is a place that has been much written about and often painted, but of which no writing and no art can convey more than a dwarfed and pallid impression. To describe it in the sense of building up a rec recognizable image by means of words is impossible. The scale is too vast, the effect too tremendous. The sense of one's own dumbness and littleness and incapacity it's too complete and crushing. It is a place that strikes you into silence, that empties you, as it were, not only of words, but of ideas. Nor is this a first effect only. Later in the year, when we came back and moored close by and spent long days among the ruins, I found I never had a word to say in the great hall. I could only look and be silent. And she goes on, Yet to look is something if one can but succeed in remembering. I stand once more among those mighty columns, which radiate into avenues from whatever point one takes them. I see them swathed in coiled shadows and broad bands of light. I see them sculptured and painted with shapes of gods and kings, with blazonings of royal names, with sacrificial altars and forms of sacred beasts and emblems of wisdom and truth. The shafts of these columns are enormous. I stand at the foot of one, or of what seems to be the foot, for the original pavement seems to be buried seven feet below. Six men, standing with outstretched arms, fingertip to fingertip, could hardly span it around. It casts a shadow twelve feet in breadth, such a shadow as might be cast by a tower. The capital that juts out so high above my head looks as if it might have been put there to support the heavens. It is carved in the semblance of a full-blown lotus and glows with undying colors, colors that are still fresh, though laid on by hands that have been dust these 3,000 years and more. That's from Amelia Edwards' book, A Thousand Miles Up the Nile. Urquhart goes on, The impression produced by another of these structures is equally overpowering, the Temple of Luxor. This is from a book by Belzoni. Quote, the Temple of Luxor presents to the traveler at once one of the most splendid groups of Egyptian grandeur. The extensive propylion, that's spelled P-R-O-P-Y-L-A-E-O-N, with two obelisks and colossal statues in front, the thick groups of enormous columns, the variety of apartments and the sanctuary it contains, the beautiful ornaments which adorn every part of the walls and columns described by Mr. Hamilton, cause in the astonished traveler an oblivion of all he has seen before. If his attention can be attracted to the north side of Thebes, by the towering remains that project a great height above the wood of palm trees, he will gradually enter the forest-like assemblage of ruins and temples, columns, obelisks, colossi, sphinxes, portals, and an endless number of other astonishing objects that will convince him at once of the impossibility of a description it is absolutely impossible to imagine the scene displayed without seeing it. The most sublime ideas that can be formed from the most magnificent specimens of our present architecture would give a very incorrect picture of these ruins. For such is the difference, not only in magnitude, but in form, proportion, and construction, that even the pencil can convey but a faint idea of the whole. It appeared to me like entering a city of giants, 
who after a long conflict were all destroyed, leaving the ruins of their various temples as the only proofs of their former existence. Urquhart concludes, the tombs of the kings excavated in the rugged, barren mountains which skirt the city on the west have added to the astonishment with which travelers have surveyed this crowning marvel of the wonders of Egypt. Nothing that has ever been said about them had prepared me for their extraordinary grandeur, says Dean Stanley about the ruins of Karnak and Thebes. You enter a sculptured portal in the face of these wild cliffs and find yourself in a long and lofty gallery, opening or narrowing, as in the case may be, into successive halls and chambers, all of which are covered with white stucco, and this white stucco brilliant with colors fresh as they were thousands of years ago. They are, in fact, gorgeous palaces. But Urquhart concludes, but on these ruins another truth is written besides that of man's greatness or the vanity of earthly glory. Such vast and surprising remains are still to be seen, says Pocock, of such magnificence and solidity as may convince anyone who beholds them that without some extraordinary accident they must have lasted forever, which seems to have been the intention of the founders of them. Of this extraordinary accident the scriptures have something quite as extraordinary to say. And he concludes with, in Ezekiel 30, verses 14 to 16, there is mention of no in each of the three verses. And he goes on in the next section, we'll have to leave it for next time, to explain why the glory of Thebes is no more, whose divine declaration guaranteed its ultimate fate. So if you want to ad advance on Urquhart's coverage of the next part, read Ezekiel 30, verses 14 to 16, where it says, I will execute judgments in No, the Egyptian word for Thebes, I will cut off the multitude of No, and No shall be broken up. I will execute judgments in No. And it seems to point to something more than an ordinary tale of siege and capture. Does the after fate of Thebes stand out then as singular on the page of Egyptian history? See you for part two next time.